Well, listen, while in Davos, they are plotting to fix the world, in Davao, we are studying that God has already prepared new heaven and new earth. So let's remember, with sin in this world, this world is unfixable, and therefore God will make new heavens and new earth. Amen? Amen. Now we, of course, are here as agents of, men, of, of righteousness to bring people unto the Lord, but by no means we think that we can correct and fix this world, or else God would have not made new heavens and new earth. The whole idea is that we need a new place, and there we will be, not just the majority, but we will be the only ones. Uh, so it's wonderful. Are you ready for a long and healthy big meal right now? Buckle your seatbelts. This is a long journey throughout the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is truth, and we ask now that you will sanctify us by this truth. And we ask that in the name of the word, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen, Amen. amen. So the first session of the five is interpreting Revelation, meaning the glorified Christ, an introduction to the church and the love letters to the bride. And we have to make it very clear from the very beginning. John made it clear from the beginning that the ultimate author of this book is who? Jesus Christ. John may have been the one to write it, but it, these are the words that he was asked to write. These are the revelations that he was given from Jesus through that angel that was sent to John. Therefore, this is, as the book begins, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not of John. It's not of a mankind. This is Jesus revealing himself, and therefore we have to remember that. And that is exactly why the book of Revelation is a book that we must read and we must study and believe it or not 90 percent of the church worldwide do not teach the book of revelation they stay away from it like from fire they don't know how to approach it how to interpret that how to read it how to understand it so they just keep it away from the people but revelation is a book to read it is in the bible therefore it is obviously for our edification it is inspired by God. It offers a special blessing to those who read it. The only book that offers special blessing to those who read it, hear, and put it to use. And of course, he tells of a future that God wants us to know. This book is a book of prophecy. This is, for the most part, from chapter 4 and on, is a book that speaks of future events. God wants you to know the end from the beginning. He declares it, as Isaiah says. There are sevenfold blessings that we can see through the book of Revelation. In 1 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Revelation 14, I heard a voice saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. 16, it says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked. He continues all the way, as you can see in Revelation 19, you can see the verse. In Revelation 20, you can see the verse. In Revelation 22, you can see the verse behind me. In Revelation 22, again in verse 14, you can see all together seven amazing blessings. And when we come to interpreting Revelation, you must understand there are four major interpreting schools um, uh, and approaches to the book of Revelation. There are the preterists, as you can clearly see, the historical, the symbolic, and the futuristic. And they, they all interpret differently the different parts of Revelation. If I can sum it up for all of you, the preterist that comes from the Latin word preter, which means it is done, it happened. Everything took place in the past, in the 70 AD, everything has been fulfilled. The book of Revelation is in a way not a book of future prophecy. 
it's a, something that was prophecy when it was written before they say, and then in 70 AD was fulfilled, that's it. And they are teaching that until today, even in the Philippines. In fact, the first time somebody approached me and said, Amir, everything has been fulfilled. Everyone is saved. You don't have to teach about the rapture of the church. It was actually in Manila, <laughs> of all places. This is a prominent teaching. People love that burden of sharing the gospel to be off their shoulder. Therefore, they gladly hop on the cart of, it's all fulfilled, that's it. Then the, the historical one believes that the entire book of Revelation represents the church history from first coming Christ to the second coming of Christ, making even the events of the tribulation as part of church history. They gladly teach that the church is even in chapter 4 to 18. The symbolic approach is that this seeks the book of, sees the book of Revelation as fictional. Fictional book. They actually believe that this is a description of a battle between good and evil and God and Satan and that's it. It's just a nice way to read about it. Are you kidding me? Isn't that interesting that the things that happen, happen really, literally. Why would you doubt that the things that will happen will not happen literally? In Israel, is the ultimate, ultimate case, showcase that God is fulfilling His word literally. For 2,000 years, people thought the Jews are gone from the stage of the world and the church has replaced Israel. And anything that is now spoken about Israel and the future of Israel is actually symbolic because it really means the church. And then in 1948, we came to pass as a nation and everybody had a punch in their nose. But whoa, God is indeed fulfilling His word literally. And therefore, I'm holding the futurist uh, approach, which by the way, you are holding right now. Because I'm teaching. And the futurist believes that the letters to the seven churches were written to seven literal churches that also describe the state of the church throughout the ages until the rapture. Hence, things that are, the Bible says. But also, John is describing future events beginning in chapter 4 through the rest of the book. Hence, things to come. This is why it's so important to not miss out the prophetic aspect of this book. In 2 Timothy, Paul already warned people about may, of saying that things have happened already. Shun profane and idle babbling, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of these sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. You see, those who believe all has been fulfilled are causing great damage to the body of Christ. And it has been already something that happened in the first century, and Paul was warning about it. Remember, if you hold the futuristic approach, you will always hold the truth that there are three groups of people in view in the New Testament, just like, um, uh, and that's why Revelation is no different. The Gentiles, the Jews, and the church. Please make sure, 1 Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians 10, 32, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. They, they, they were mentioned specifically, and they were dealt with specifically, and they were talked about specifically. So the book of Revelation is no exception. It's also speaking, speaking of Israel, speaking of the Gentiles, and speaking of the church. And this is why it's important that you understand there are some aspects in the book that speaks about Israel, some speaks about the rest of the world, the unbelieving world, and some are speaking about the church. And therefore, when in chapter 4 to 19, the word church is not even mentioned, that is not for the church, and that is not about the church. This is important that you understand. The word of God is very specific about who he's talking about and what he is saying. Now, part of the reason for the literal interpretation to be criticized widely is because 
The book of Revelation is based on a vision that John received. However, most prophetic scriptures are future events given in a vision or dream that ultimately find its fulfillment literally. You see that in Revelation it says, I was in the spirit. In chapter 4, immediately I was in the spirit. Chapter 17, he carried me away in the spirit. Chapter 21, and he carried me away in the spirit again. So you understand, John was receiving just like Isaiah and just like Jeremiah and just like Hosea and all of them received visions. Do you think that the return of the Jews to the land was described to Ezekiel not in a vision? It was in a vision. The vision of the dry bones, if you remember. So even here, this is a vision, but it will be literally fulfilled. And this is all about meeting the exalted Christ. Jesus Christ is being revealed in this book, and he's all over this book. There is in chapter 1, Jesus the revealer. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus the shepherd. In chapter 4 and 5, Jesus the lion and the lamb. Chapters 6 to 18, Jesus the rightful judge. Yes, he can also judge. In chapters 19 to 20, Jesus the returning and reigning king. And in chapter 20 to 22, Jesus the recreator. It's all about him. It is the revelation of him. And we need to speak about him and glorify him when we study this book. How can we stay away from the book that is the revelation of Jesus and it is all about Jesus? He's the revealer in Revelation chapter 1, 17 and 18. As you can clearly see. He is the shepherd in Revelation 1 verse 20 regarding uh, walking through the seven golden lampstands, which are the seven stars, which are the seven churches. He is the shepherd. He is walking through. He is speaking. He is relevant to the churches. He knows what's going on in every church. He knows what's going on in the hearts of every believer. He knows what every pastor is teaching. He knows what every pastor is hiding. He knows what every worship leader and what every worship team is doing, whether they are worshiping him or glorifying themselves. He knows he is walking through and he is seeing, he is watching. Nothing can be hidden from him. Jesus is also the rightful judge. God gave him the task to judge, if you remember that. And then Jesus is going to do that. He's, he's in full obedience to the Father. Jesus is, well, he came not to judge but to save, but he will return to judge. Revelation 6, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, voice like, come and see, and of course, the witnessing of the judgment that began all the way until Revelation 19. And then Jesus is the returning and reigning king from chapter 19 all the way. And then, of course, the recreator of new heaven and new earth in Revelation 21. And we conclude the book in 22. So if the events of Revelation are still future... When are they to take place? Interestingly enough, the Greek word is egus, which means near in the book of Revelation, in your English translation, near. Now, for example, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Again, in Revelation 22, the time is near. In Philippians 4, 5, the Lord is near. In Matthew 24, know that it is near at your doors. Second Peter is the key to understand what near means. In 2 Peter chapter, two, verse, uh, chapter 3, excuse me, verses 5 to 9, he says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget. They forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, and by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word 
are preserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And now is the key to understand the near, the egus. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as thousand years and thousand years as one day. God is now working according to our timetable. He is not hurrying up because of our requests. Guess why He is not judging the world yet? Guess why we're still here? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some count slackness. But what? He is long suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish. But that, let's read it together. But that all should come to repentance. Aren't we glad that God is long suffering? Hallelujah. We see in the book of Revelation the triune Godhead in in, 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 in an amazing display, that which is attacked even today, the fact that Godhead is of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, they are one, but they are not the same. It's not like Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. God is the Father is the Father. Look, here in Davao, the definition has changed, I know. I heard that the, Jesus was promoted to be the Father and someone else was promoted to be the Son. But that's not the Bible. Definitely not the Bible. The triune Godhead. In Revelation 1, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from one, him who is and was and is to come, and from two, this is a, another way to describe the Holy Spirit. The seven different spirits of God of, of, that are before the throne. And then three, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Normally it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here he introduces us the Father and the Holy Spirit because about the Son, he is going to talk the rest of the book. You understand that? This is how it works. And those seven spirits in Revelation 1, 4, we hear about them and we hear about in Revelation 3, 1, in Revelation 4, and Revelation 5. Remember what Isaiah wrote in chapter 11. He says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Seven spirits that are actually the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God that was resting upon the Son of God when He came in order to uh, fulfill His calling to die for us. Amen? So now we understand what it's all about. And the Bible says that every eye shall see in Revelation 1-7, Behold, He's coming with clouds. Now make no mistake, every word in the Bible makes a difference and it's important and it's important that we do not mix and confuse all of them in Revelation it says behold he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him and every uh, and even they who pierced him this is a general announcement to the world that the world and the Jews who are those who pierced him what is Zechariah 12 saying they looked at him whom they pierced that means the nations and Israel will see Him coming. This is not the intimate coming of Jesus for us. This is the public coming of Jesus to the rest of the world. Daniel is talking about it also when he's coming with the clouds of heaven. He's saying that same thing. Matthew 24 regarding the second coming. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. We will not mourn when He's coming to take us. We will be glad when He's coming to take us. But when He returns in His second coming to the world, they will all mourn and cry. And Israel will mourn and cry as well. In Matthew 26, Jesus said to him, It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds. So it's with the clouds and it's on the clouds, which is important because it's different than in the clouds. Listen to this. Now, who are the recipients of this letter? In Revelation 1, 11, it says, 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to who? To the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to the Laodicea. And as we see this, we understand that these, these are all mentioned in a geographical order, beginning with Ephesus, which was the closest in location to where John was, all the way to the farthest most. Now, it is his promise to return to judge and to rule. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see. And the Bible says that in all the tribes of earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. He will come and he will rule as we can see that all around and again as i said zechariah 12 are those who pierced him israel as well will see him upon his second coming and again the preposition is important he's coming with the clouds and on the clouds at the second coming and this will be a public event but first thessalonians 4 that speaks about our gathering to be with him look what he says the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of god and the dead in christ will rise first and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the lord in the air and so thus we shall always be with the lord he is in the air is in the clouds this is not about the rest of the people no one will see it we will see him it will be intimate it will be for us we will be glad and one of the main things we'll be glad about is we will not be like this we will receive our glorified body a new body and that alone will make you so happy well hallelujah so that is a private event. And Jesus is the I am. Remember that. That is a declaration of his divinity, of his deity. We do not worship a man. We do not believe that the Son of God is a flesh and blood only. We believe that it is God who became flesh and dwelled among us. Emmanuel, God is, in, is with us. And therefore in Revelation 1a, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 11, again, Alpha and Omega. In Revelation 1.17 and 1.18 and 21.6 and 22.13, this is because for John as a Jew, he knew exactly what even Isaiah the prophet spoke of the nature of the divine presence which is to be the beginning and to be the end and not to have any time stamp, time stamp. Jesus is the sharp two-edged sword revelation is speaking of he is sharp and two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in strength and you can clearly see the same thing in revelation 2 12 Hebrews 4 says, for the word of God, and Jesus is the word of God, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now we are about to see throughout the book of Revelation, the exalted Christ. This is not the Christ that is anymore on the cross this is not the christ who suffered this is not the christ who was led to the slaughter this is the exalted christ the one that is in the throne room of god the one that everyone is bowing down for the one that is worthy to open the scroll and revelation 1 says i john both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he gives all those names. He is the Alpha, he's the Omega. He's the one who is revealing himself to John. And he says, John, write it and send it. People need to know. People need to have this revelation. John 
would have realized the divinity of the voice because the words the speaker is used to identify himself would have been familiar to a Jew. Isaiah 44, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Isaiah 48, listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I'm also the last. And in those days, it was mostly the Old Testament as the scripture in the hands of the apostles and the disciples. Therefore, these are the words that John is familiar with. And these are the words that now as he hears the revelation, he connects with and he understands. We indeed are now listening to the exalted Christ. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. The Son of Man. Isn't that amazing? This term exists 189 times in the Old Testament, half of which are in the book of Ezekiel. It, in a way, for Ezekiel to describe himself, by the way, as the one to whom God is speaking. The prophet Ezekiel is responsible, as I said, to almost half of these things. But with the next book of the Bible, Daniel, a shift occurred. And what once was either a generic term for humanity or a moniker for a prophet, it became a descriptive name for only one person. And Daniel wrote it. I was watching in the night vision. And behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. With the clouds of heaven he came to the ancient of days. To the Lord God Father. And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given. The father relinquishes to his son. To the son of man. To the, the one that is all over and will be all over. He says he gives him dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. This is why we have to hold on to the key verse in Revelation 1.19. Write the things which you have seen and, are you with me? Write the things that you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. John is very clear. He is witnessing what happened. He is witnessing what is going on now in the lifetime of the church, but he's also given a vision of what will happen after, after the church age, after we are taken out of here, after we are united with the Lord. God is giving John a way to explain to the rest of the world what the world is going to go through. Look, I have no doubt that the world is not reading the book of Revelation. I have no doubt that in, in Muslim mosques or in Jewish synagogues, or in, in any other religion, they don't sit and study the book of Revelation. This book was not written for a Buddhist or for a Muslim. Of course, I wish they read it, but it was written to the churches. It was written to the churches. Why? So every Christian will know what this world is going to go through, and every Christian will appreciate what God is exempting him from, and every Christian will have that burning flame of sharing the gospel because of what he knows that this world is going to go through. Chapter 1 is the things which you have seen. Chapter 2 and 3, the things which are. Chapters 4 to 22, things which will take place after this. So we see on this big um, chart, the exalted Lord Jesus Christ is the focus of the entire book. Outline is the things which you have seen, things which are, and everything from chapter 4 and on, things which shall take place after this. We see Jesus is everywhere. Judgments begin only in chapter 6 and on. Church is on earth in, until chapter 3 is in heaven, chapter 4 to 18, and back to earth with Jesus, 19 to 22. Israel 
In chapter 1 to 5, the letters to the churches is not speaking much about Israel. But then it's purged by fire through the tribulation. And then all Israel will be saved, as the Bible says. The nations are not mentioned because the letter to the churches are for the churches. And then the nations will experience God's wrath throughout the tribulation. And they are already gone in the new heaven and new earth. Because only those written in the Lamb's book of life would dwell in that city satan is under god's permissive will in the first part and then he's empowering the antichrist throughout the tribulation and then he's condemned to the lake of fire at the very end this is the most comprehensive revelation of the future of israel of the church of the world and of even the satanic realm we better not say we don't know not only does Jesus want you to understand what's already taken place, but he wants you to understand today and prepare for tomorrow. So let's have an introduction to the church. It's important. What is the church? <laughs> you know, we say that word all the time, but in Acts chapter 2, we, we get an understanding of what the church is all about. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as in the Lord our God uh, the, the Lord our God will call the church is compromised uh, it, <laughs> the church is comprised of people compromised of course it's compromised unfortunately but the church in general is comprised of people who have been born again. There is no... Look, the first time I came to Manila, never forget it. It was 25 years ago. By the way, I celebrate 25 years of ministry. And it began here in this country. And the first time I walk in the streets of Manila and I talk with someone, he's asking me, so what are you, born again or Catholic? And I'm like, I didn't know you have options here. Because in my mind, there's only, Christian is born again. You cannot be a Christian and not be born again. There's no such thing. No one ever was born a Christian. If you are born a Christian, omit that from your birth certificate. You were born a sinner. To be able to call yourself a Christian, to begin with, you have to be born again. And so the church is comprised of people who have been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, in response to the Jerusalem Jews' question about what they should do in light of his fiery message, answered and said, and then the Bible says, Repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One thing we cannot overlook is that Peter said, uh, we cannot overlook is that Peter said this promise is perpetual. And it is, uh, it, means, and it means that what the church was in the beginning is what the church will be in the end. A collective body of spirit-filled, born-again believers. Are you? Spirit filled, if you are not, that's why you're here. To understand that you need to be. And by the way, that's why we're not raptured yet. Because of you. <laughs> God is long suffering. Now, who does the church belong to? Matthew 16 says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Oh, we belong to Peter? No, we are not. There have been a lot of interpretive gymnastics surrounding this comment that Jesus said about on this rock. The rock is not Peter. Jesus, Peter is a Petros. It's a little stone. But upon this rock, the rock of the proclamation, the confession of Peter that Jesus is the son of the living God that's the one rock that we are built upon that's the one truth that we belong to Jesus is the Lord of the church not Peter excuse me for saying that now covenant theology teaches that the church was in the Old Testament did you know that they say that uh, because they you know in the Septuagint which is the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek roughly 200 BC. The word ecclesia, which is the word for the church in the New Testament, is found there referring to the, referring to the assembly of the Jews. 
Well, you know, not every time a word appears in one book, it means of the same thing in the second one. And the reason is very simple. Though the same Greek word is translated church in the New Testament, that's not what we need to remember. We need to remember that Jesus did not say that he was going to build upon the Old Testament church, but rather upon this rock, I will build. Which means it was a future thing. The church in Matthew 16 was a future event when Peter was acknowledging that Jesus is the son of the living God. Which means Israel of the Old Testament could have not been the church. You understand that? But the church is not Israel also. <laughs> Don't make that mistake as well. Now the church in the book of Revelation, we see an amazing thing. It is of course the bride and he is the bridegroom. And there are many parallels between the church and the Jewish wedding. And the church is now called betrothal period. Uh, this is when we belong to him, but we're not yet married to him. But we're fully belong to him legally and spiritually. The church will experience the normal ebb and flow of life just as a bride would go with, uh, with her life during the betrothal in an unconsummated relationship with her groom until the time of the ceremony at the groom's father's house. And that's up there. That means you have to be raptured. You have to be taken because we're not guests of the wedding. We are the bride. You cannot be late. You have to be there. The end of our seven years in the Father's house, we will return with Jesus to rule and reign with Him on the earth. So take a look at this interesting development. We live right now in the betrothal period. And 2 Corinthians indeed is speaking about that uh, period. And then, of course, the church is on earth before the tribulation. Then is the rapture where we are in the presence of God. There's the bema seat of Christ. We are being rewarded for our uh, 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 actions as believers and the intentions of whatever we did. And, and then, of course, this is while the world on earth goes through the great tribulation. This is why the word church is not mentioned in those chapters of the book of Revelation. We're up there going through this amazing wedding while the rest of the world go through almost hell. And then the Bible says, returning and reigning with him. The church returns to earth after the tribulation as Revelation says, Revelation 19 and he's coming. Now watch this parallel on the screen. The, uh, look, in 1 Corinthians 15, look what it says. I don't know if you have it here, but I have a parallel of three verses. There you go. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, and we shall be changed. Now let's look at first. Um, th this was 1 Corinthians 15. Now let's look at what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. For the Lord himself will descend. Which means he's up in heaven now. From heaven with a shout. With a voice of an archangel. And with what? The trumpet of God. People misinterpret the whole trumpet thing. Thinking that the trumpet judgments are the, related to the rapture. No, they are related to, to punishment. They're unrelated to anything that has to do with us. That's the trumpet of God that is sounding in heaven, that is welcoming us into heaven. And watch this, the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we. We see that. There is always the promise for those believers who already perish that they will be risen. It has nothing to do with any tribulation, with any judgment. This has to do with his private promise to his own bride. And in Revelation 4, after these things, remember after these things, after these things, after the church is coming to an end, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like, what? 
The trumpet. That's the trumpet that is blowing. That's the trumpet that is inviting us into heaven. And look what he says. Come up here. We are to go up. Remember? Come up here. I will show you things which must. Say must. Must take place after this. And from this moment on, throughout the book of Revelation, he is describing the tribulation. He is taking us up and he is telling us those things that are about to happen must happen. You watch them from up here. Amen? Amen. Now during the tribulation, we will be with the Lord and during the seven years while on earth, uh, the 70th week of Daniel is being fulfilled. This will be the end of the betrothal period with the church's marriage to the Lord. And while in heaven, we will all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. As 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Look, we're not going to hell. We're already in heaven. <laughs> it's not like Peter is standing with a list of... Uh, hmm. What's your name, please? <laughs> and now during the millennium, Revelation 5 is speaking about that. During the millennial period, <laughs> look, look what he says. And, 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 when, I heard, and when, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll. We just sang, is he worthy? Yes, he is. You, Lord, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. And for you were slain. What makes Jesus worthy? He was slain. He died for us. He took our punishment. He took our death. He took everything that we deserve upon himself. So he is worthy. He is worthy for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by what? By your blood. You shed your blood so I can be redeemed and I can be reconciled to God. Out of, now watch this, and you have redeemed us out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. All of us. Look at you. I'm a Jew from Jerusalem, from Israel. A, a, a Gentile from California. We have from other places in the United States as well. And we have people from every part of Mindanao and other parts of the Philippines. We have people watching this thing and will watch this thing from every part of the world. Because God has made us from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. We are a new nation. All of us have now two passports. You have your Filipino one, but you also have your heavenly one. And wait, with your heavenly one, now you are ambassadors here. And the Bible says that we are now a holy nation. And we, he has made us kings and priests to our God. And we, well, 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 what word is it? Shall, future tense. We shall reign on the earth. So yes, Amir, but we're not running on earth right now. Yes, we're not running right now because we're not there yet with him. We're not yet coming back with him. But the minute we go to that marriage and we come back with him, what do you think you're coming back like? Not like this. You have your glorified body. You're riding a white horse behind Jesus. And we come to rule and reign on earth. And after the millennium, first Satan is crushed based on Genesis 3, 8, 15, that his head will be crushed, remember, and thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophets already reside. And this is followed by God's removing the old order and creating a new order. He removes the old heavens and look, on, not only earth is defiled, even heaven is defiled. Satan rebelled first, not men, not Adam. Satan rebelled first. 
Heaven is contaminated. And therefore, even there is a need for a new heaven, not only a new earth. And therefore, he will make all things new. And along with the new heaven and earth, the new Jerusalem descends out of heaven. And what a spectacular sight to behold. And Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 and 2 Peter 3 and Revelation 21 is talking about it. And the book of Revelation was a letter to the seven literal churches that were located in Asia, present-day Turkey mostly. And we learn in chapter uh, uh, 1 that Jesus walks, present tense by the way, not past, walks, he's still walking. He walks among his churches, evaluating their doctrine, their lifestyle, their love for him and for one another, and their outreach to those in need and those who have never heard the gospel. God sees everything. Even in the tiniest small church in Davao, all the way to the mega churches elsewhere around the world. He knows exactly what they're all about. He knows exactly the intentions behind all of this. And the Bible says that he, com he complimented five of the seven and reprimanded all but two. And when we turn to Revelation 2 and 3, we encounter seven literal congregations. For most of them, Jesus has some good news, but for some... He has some bad news. There are those who are convinced, by the way, that the church will be, giving, will be going through part of all the tribulation. However, when we recognize God's purpose for the tribulation, putting the church through it is not even one of them. God's purpose, obviously, is for Israel's salvation, for judgment upon the nations that rejected Him, and for the final judgment of Satan at the very end of it. The church is not part of it. He will present his bride holy and blameless before the Lord. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to sanctify the church. Not the responsibility of the tribulation to sanctify the church. So there's so many people, we have to go through the tribulation to be sanctified. We are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It's almost like, beat me up, please, so I will feel holier. <laughs> so where is the church? Now, take a look. Right now, we are on earth. First century, all the way to the 21st century. Obviously, we're still here. We will be soon go up to heaven, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, and to be there, and that is described in 4 and 5. And then, in Revelation 19, we come back with Jesus to earth. As Zechariah 14.5, thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. <laughs> We're coming with him. And then when he makes all things new, we go to be in the new Jerusalem. As, Re as Revelation 21, I saw the holy city. And of course, who is going to be there? Only those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The church begins its journey through time. Here on earth, from the first century to the rapture. You will spend seven years in the Father's house with the Lord. Returns with Jesus to rule and reign in righteousness at the second coming. And lives eternal perfection in the new Jerusalem after the millennium. But one question that many Bible uh, uh, detectors uh, like to use is. If God is love, then what is the purpose of the tribulation? Isn't a time of catastrophe such as the world uh, has never seen, which uh, uh, to them is inconsistent with a loving God? Well, listen, this is not the case. To the seven churches, he explains everything. And while some scholars like to limit the seven letters to strictly being applicable to each literal church and contain lessons for the very uh, 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 for every, um, uh, you know, one of them, we must remember that history makes it clear that there is a chronology to the letters that was not visible in the past. This is exactly what Daniel 12.4 says. Look, I'm giving you, Daniel, something that only in the future people will be able to understand. He says, 
where Daniel was told the visions are received, were sealed to him, but those alive at the time of, of the end could see their meaning with clarity. On top of that, Revelation 1.3 says in Revelation 22.18, both report that this book is prophecy, which means future. And there is nothing anywhere in the book that indicates that chapter 2 and 3 are not prophetic. So even though they talk about real churches that existed, they have a prophetic component to it regarding the future. Don't only look at that as past. Take a look at this chart. This is a very heavy chart. But you need to understand, this is how the Lord is speaking to every one of the churches Every one of the letters has a different, has a meaning for the church. The period that he's representing, it's important that you understand that even though he spoke to Ephesus about um, uh, all the affairs and, and, and the compliment and for their faithfulness and concern about losing their first love and correction and encouragement, it is also something that described the entire apostolic first century and second century. Smyrna, yes. Smyrna comes from the word mirror. It comes from, from some fragrance. And of course, we will go through it in a few seconds. But it is talking about also or depicting the persecution in, in the third century. And then comes Thyatira. And Pergamon, excuse me. Speaking about marriage, Pergamon. And then he speaks of Constantine in the fourth and the sixth century that supposedly made the church the uh, the state religion of the Roman Empire. Th you know, we have Thyatira, speaking of continual sacrifice, speaks of the 7th to the 15th century of the Middle and Dark Ages. And Sardis, speaking of a remnant, and it's speaking about, of course, foreshadowing the Reformation from the 16th to the 20th century. And today, unfo unfortunately, I can tell you, in the 21st century and on, uh, from the 18th to the 20th, we, we do speak of the beautiful missionary movement in Philadelphia. But as of the 21st century, we live in the last days and we do live in the days of Laodicea. And we will see that in a few seconds. With that said, the letters to the church are a march forward in time. As I said, Ephesus represents the apostolic age. Smyrna represents uh, 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 the church of the third century, Pergamon. We, we, we went through all of that. So remember, these are love letters to the churches. Love letters to the bride. And he's saying there what he honors and what he's not honoring so much. He honors faithful service. To Ephesus in Revelation 2, 9, he says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. You see, the word tribulation is... Ever since the birth of the church, it has going through tribulations. Never ever the church was accepted and was celebrated by the sinful world. And, and he says, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. To Thyatira, in Revelation 2.19, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Remember... Smyrna represents the age of great persecution of the early church. Thyatira is of the dark ages of idolatry and sinfulness in the church. And the Lord commends and therefore calls all of us to be faithful when persecution of the church is rampant, even today. And when the majority of the church has defected from truth and become worldly. In other words... God is saying even to us today, you and me, be faithful no matter what is going around you. We need to remember that faithful service is not the obligation of some people in the church. It is the calling of us all. And Paul would go as far as to say that it is actually required. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found Faithful, the Bible says. He also speaks of moral purity. To Ephesus, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. He also said in 2.6, But this 
you have that you have you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, and we'll talk about them in a few seconds. See, much of the church today seems to think that welcoming sin in the church is being loving. And yet the truth is far from it. In fact, to tell people that they are saved in their unrepented and habitual sinful condition is actually the spirit of the Antichrist, if anything. As is the heretical teaching of the antinomianism, those who, has, who say there is no moral law, there is no moral code, Anyone can do whatever he wants. We are all under grace. That's exactly the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Those who say there is no moral law or standards by which the Christian should live because we are all saved by grace do not understand what grace is in the first place. See, in Genesis 6, 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The word grace in the Hebrew, chen. Matzah chen. Chen. It's amazing. The word chen means to stoop to an inferior in kindness. This is what God did for Noah. And it is from this act of God that we get the definition of grace as unmerited favor. But 2 Corinthians says, For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. See, the Greek word translated as grace is charis. It is the only word used in the New Testament for grace, and it does not mean unmerited favor in, many, in, in any place that it is used. The word charis means divine inspiration in the heart and its reflection in the life. In other words, grace is an outward, visible, tangible reflection of the work of God in your life. Can adultery or idolatry do that? Can they be a manifestation of the work of God in you? Can fornication or sorcery do that? Can lying, cheating or stealing reflect the work of God in your life? That means moral purity matters and it condemned by God. So sound doctrine has to be also addressed because in Ephesus, to Ephesus he says, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And to Smyrna he said, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. We'll address that. And to Philadelphia, in Revelation 3.19, he says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. See, we live at a time where there is a group who are claiming to be the apostles at the same sense as uh, the original 12. They, they claim to be just like first century apostles, and everything they say equals to the Word of God. That's the new apostolic reformation that you better stay away from. And in that sense, um, look, all of us are sent. All of us, in a way, have the apostolic um, uh, ministry. We're all sent to be an apostle, is to be one who is sent. But remember, there is a difference, however, between the office of the apostle, like Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the twelve, and one who is sent. Ephesians says, He himself gave to some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. The same is true of the prophet. There is a difference in the gift of prophecy and the office of the prophet. Jesus appoints apostles and the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 11, distributes spiritual gifts as He wills, not as we choose. See, the Lord commends Ephesus for testing those who claim to be apostles and finding them liars. God says, you're very good. An apostle in, an, in the office of apostle sense has to be one who was there during Jesus' earthly ministry from the time he was baptized until he was taken up, according to Acts 1, 21 and 22. 
And also, he must be an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord, according to Paul, which one, by the way, he was the only apostle born out of due time, as recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Look, these are the letters that Jesus writes to the churches even today. These are the same truths. The same thing we go through today is the same thing they went through then. The Bible says nothing of a new set of apostles coming at the end of the church age to lead the church to global domination over seven mountains of power and, and re prepare the world for the return of Christ. We are not to prepare the world. He's preparing a place for us. Behold, I go to my Father. I am preparing a place for you. And if it's not so, I would have told you. And then I'm coming, what? To receive you unto myself. So where I am, you, be so, you also be. So he is preparing a place for us here. Yes, we have to work, uh, you know, and, and as workers of righteousness. And we have to preach the word. We have to be uh, workers of righteousness. We have to be preachers of the word. We have to be about our father's business. But do you think that just like those in Davos, yesterday I saw John Kerry saying, we are the elite. We are like coming out of another sphere to fix this world. That's what they think, that they can fix the world. We know that nothing can fix the world but Jesus. And, for, and this world will go so bad that at the appointed time, he will take us up so he can judge this world in righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, faithful endurance of persecution to Smyrna in Revelation 2.10. He said, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Let's understand what 10 days means in a few seconds. Until death and I will give you the crown of life. And to Pergamos in Revelation 2.13, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And I've seen photos from Pergamon. I've seen the place where they called the seat of Satan right there. And to Sardis in Revelation 3, 4, you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. And to Philadelphia, he says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test who? To test those who dwell on the earth. You see, the fact that four churches in Four different periods of church history are commended for enduring persecution tells us times of, of, of persecution will make regular visits to the church throughout its history. The important thing for us is to remember that persecution is not a lapse in divine favor. It's not God overseeing things, God overlooking things, God is, is, is out of focus. The Bible says that the Lord begins with the church at Smyrna. The world which means, the, that word means myrrh. This embalming spice had to be crushed to, be, to release its fragrance. And Smyrna was under a heavy crushing time of persecution. And when like Polycarp, who was a, a disciple of John the Beloved, they were releasing the fragrance of Christ during persecution. The Lord mentions that they will have tribulation 10 days. Now, as you see, Luke 17, as in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. See, a day is not only, uh, you know, a 24-hour period. When Jesus mentioned 10 days, it doesn't mean only that. It's like Noah's days, which speaks of a period of time. The church was going to suffer 10 periods of persecution. These began with Caesar Nero, as you all know, who actually burned Rome and blamed it on the Christians. 
and lasted until and, and, and it lasted all the way until 313 when Constantine declared the edict of toleration and recognizing Christianity as the religion of Rome. This is within that time all the way until Constantine 10 periods. We're talking about Nero who executed Peter and Paul um, uh, that was followed by Domitian who banished John who was followed by Trajan who wrote into law that it was illegal to be Christian who killed Polycarp the bishop here in Smyrna. Trajan was followed by Marcus Aurelius who killed Justin Martyr and others. Then Severus, Maximus, Decius, Valerian, Aurelian and finally the reign of terror concluded with Diocletian from 284 to 305 AD. Prophecy. Future. Ten days. You're going to have ten periods of severe persecution by that same Roman Empire. And a pinch of incense had to be offered while declaring with your mouth, Caesar is Lord. You couldn't just worship anything you want. You had to acknowledge Caesar. A certificate would be issued that, you, that would be read as an archaeological example has uncovered. It says, we, the representatives of the emperor Severus and Hermas, we have seen, your, we have seen you sacrificing. You could then be free to practice whatever recognized religion you choose to believe. You see, even Christians were told, it's okay, you can be Christians. Just remember, you have to sacrifice for Caesar. You have to say that first, he is like God. See, Polycarp was taken to the arena and tied to stake. They came to him. He was the bishop of Smyrna. He would not make any per compromise. And as the Romans guard came to his home on April 29th, 155 AD, they pleaded with this wonderful and godly man to recant his faith in Christ. He refused and they took him all the way to the arena and tied him to a stake with his captors pleading with him to make this one small concession. Just say that and don't worry. History tells us they was tied to the stake on the Sabbath. Even Jewish people helped in this thing. And the Bible says that as the fire was lit, an overzealous soldier struck at Polycarp with his javelin, hitting him in the shoulder, severing an artery. And the blood that squirted from his body extinguished the fire. So the, the Romans thought, oh, this is, a, this is from God. Please, look, God loves you. Recant your faith. It's like, it's an oxymoron. But he said, 86 years I have served my Lord and not once he has failed me. I will not deny him now. Then the fire was rekindled and Polycarp became a martyr rather than deny his Lord. And while there have been martyrs in the church in every century, the 20th century saw more martyrs than all previous 20, uh, 19 combined. Did you know that? And what we need to remember, folks, is that it takes the same strength to live for Christ as it does to die for Christ. And uh, we are the Lord's, and we need to remember that. Faithfulness to the Word of God, we need to remember. To Philadelphia, he said, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word. And have not denied my name. You cannot just, oh, I don't deny the name of Jesus. But I don't read his word. I don't keep his word. You, can't, you don't do that. <laughs> on, the, on the plane over here. I saw two women. I, I think it's women. And they were holding a little baby Jesus uh, statue. And one of them had a mask on the little baby statue's face. <laughs> They brought him from Cebu. 
That's not his word. That's not how you keep his word. In order to keep his word, you have to get rid of idols, not to make new ones. Taking advantage of open doors. To Philadelphia, he says, these things say, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength and have kept my word. Take advantage. The Philippines is by far the most open country in the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've traveled all around the world. All around the world. I'm telling you, no country is as open to the gospel as this country. Not, no country. Take advantage of this open door. Now what is it that God rebuked? The church was in danger of becoming an organization rather than living and loving organism teeming with life and love. To Ephesus in Revelation 2, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. How can you call yourself a believer when... It, Everything else is your first love. Everything else is the things that you think of and do and, 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 and entertain yourself with. He tells the church to get back to the first love relationship which reminds us that Christianity is about a relationship with the Lord, not with a church. 90% of the Philippines is afflicted with a relationship with a church, not with the Lord. As a Christian, we should go to church and be functioning and participating members of the body of Christ in which every part does its share. But we always have to keep that primary relationship alive and strong, our love relationship with the Lord. He also come against immorality. To Pergamos in Revelation 2, he says, I have a few things against you because you have there... The, there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Isn't that interesting? When, 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 when Gentiles like you became believers in the first century, Jews like me didn't know what to do with you. Look at you, all of you Dinoguan drinkers. What are we going to do with them? And so they met in Jerusalem in Acts 15. And they decided that there are certain things that everyone, whether Gentile or Jew, should be staying away from. And one of them is sexual immorality and blood and things offered to idols. The doctrine of Balaam is twofold. It is anti-Semitism. As Balaam taught King Balak how to lead Israel into bringing curse upon themselves. And secondly, the doctrine of Balaam is the attitude that one can be fully cooperative with the world and still serve God. And in other words, the doctrine of Balaam teaches compromise. This is why the next commends uh, 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 Pergamum, uh, he next commends Pergamum for exposing false doctrine. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which thing I hate, repent or else I will come to you. You know what the Nicolaitans said? You can sin, you're all under grace, do whatever you want. The deeds of the Nicolaitans in the letter of Ephesus had become doctrine by the time the third century arrived. You first tolerate it, then it becomes your doctrine. Look at the, look at the churches around the world. The, what they teach now is what they began to tolerate 40 years ago. Now they teach it. And it's all against the word of God. This is why we do not allow biblically prohibited practices into the church. 
They will soon become the teaching of the church. The Nicolaitans means to conquer the people. And it is the hierarchical system within the church born at this time that the church is commended for hating in Ephesus. It was being embraced as doctrine by Pergamon. In Laodicea, the Lord rebukes a positive outward reputation, but inward spiritual decay. And we see that. The churches are building hierarchies and hierarchies, and, and the clergy becomes further and further and further away from the people. And then the clergy becomes higher in, in actual physical realm. And then they have high, different gowns and different hats and different things. And before you know it, that's it. Leadership and, and flock are two different levels. They're not even held to the same, the same level anymore. It is sadly that the age of the church history in which we now live, an age where the self-perception delusion that is in the world is the same thing Jesus rebukes. The I, for example, I'm born a male, but I can be a female because that's how I see myself. This is the perception. It's all about what you feel, what you see, what you think, how you view things versus how God did things. How did he create us? Male and female. That's it. End of story. Not 50 genders. But the Bible says that it, it will eventually creep into the church. And it will eventually become doctrine of church. To see oneself as wealthy and in need of nothing spiritually. Yet in reality you're being wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. In Thyatira, he also rebuked their toleration of sin. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you have allowed that woman Jezebel, it wasn't her name, Jezebel is a title, a Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. I didn't, I, I indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her. Look, Jezebel was the daughter of the Sidonian king at Baal. And she married King Ahab. Who according to 1 Kings 16.30, he did more evil than any of the kings before him. And the marriage was one of convenience for it established a trade alliance between Sidon and the northern kingdom of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Thyatira, to, to whom this letter was written, it was a home to many trade guilds or unions, if you would say. Each union, whether it was weavers, cloth dyers, carpenters, tanners, included a pagan god that was actually, was, had to be worshipped in order for you to practice your trade. Every one. And there was a trade alliance with false gods. And, and that Jezebel woman who taught that the meat offered to idols and sexual immoralities required of pagan deities was a small, small price to pay. Look, we want to survive in this world. Do you want money? Do you want business? All you need to do is just allow this little thing. You know, if their God says, oh, kiss the feet of that uh, idol, do it. Oh, no. it's okay. It's a small price to pay for the right to work and, and feed your family. She seduced so many that it's okay. To do all these things as long as, as you are the breadwinner. Bring money. Feed your family. That's what matters. And this is exactly in contradiction to the church council in Acts 15. When John, excuse me, James wrote. It is, seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you. No greater burden than these necessary things. Look, he says, you don't have to circumcise. You don't have to keep the law. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to become Jews. It's okay, we're not expecting you to be Jews. We ourselves have a hard time being Jews. But then he said, but you have to, be, to do only this. Abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, 
You will do well. Farewell. <laughs> he wrote this short letter to all the Gentiles that are now members of the church. Stay away from these four things. Farewell. And what did she tell them? It's okay to do two of the four. <laughs> it's okay. No, no, no. This is first century. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not okay. Jezebel taught that the council in Jerusalem, what, what they forbid, she taught that the church at Thyatira allowed it and was rebuked for it by the head of the church himself, Jesus Christ. And then he commends the overcomers to Ephesus. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If you overcome, if you are his, if you are born again, spirit-filled Christian, you will reside in Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, where the tree of life is once again there. To Smyrna in Revelation 2, he who, who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Second death, lake of fire is not for us. How? Because we are not destined to the wrath of God. To Pergamos in Revelation, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on this white new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. In Thyatira, speaking of the overcomers as well. To Sardis, speaking of their overcomers. To Philadelphia, speaking of overcoming. And even to Laodicea today. Are you born again, born of God? Yes. Then you are an overcomer. Yes. Amen. Yes. Have you placed your faith in what Jesus did on the cross for you? Not adding anything to what he has done? Yes. Then you are an overcomer. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Then you are an overcomer. Yes. So these promises in Revelation 2 and 3 are for you and for me. Amen. The word overcomers means to get the victory. Amen? Amen? It means that no matter what is going on in the world, no matter how corrupt the world or the church has become, we can always overcome everything that comes against us. Simply because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. 1 John 4.4 4. The weapons formed against us will not prosper. And every tongue that speaks against us shall be condemned. As Isaiah 54.17 says. For this is our heritage as a servant of the Lord. And our righteousness is from him says the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these amazing, amazing words of, of the author of this letter. And now as we enter into the next phase, give us hearts to understand and open the eyes of our hearts to behold the beauty of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.